Well, good afternoon. I'm Kafu Jossan. I'm assistant professor at Duke University in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Bioengineering, and neuro, uh, Neurobiology and Neurosurgery as well. So um, this is probably my most depressing slide on here, um, but I'm working on <laughs> fixing it. <laughs> So I, I, so I know this is a psychiatry talk, but um, I'll start by giving you all a confession. I'm totally jealous of my friends that are cardiologists. And, and so I, I've thought about a lot of the, this framework um, that they get to navigate, right? And so they're able to find folks that have illness, and in this case, we'll talk about something like heart, heart disease or a heart attack. They have treatments, um, things like pacemakers, things that increase contractility with the goal of making the heart function more normally. And so folks come in, they get, um, whether it's a cardiac MRI or an EKG, and you're ultimately able to try to make the heart function more normally. On top of that, you know, in the, in the 50s, we initiated the study, the Framingham study, and and what they did in that case was they followed a population over time. So they took individuals who were young, tracked them over time, and measured all kinds of variables, right? And what they wanted to ask in that sense were what were the variables that would ultimately predict who would get a heart attack and who wouldn't. And they were able to discover things like blood pressure and cholesterol and smoking. And you can think about this as a goal of the type of the thing we're trying to do, but they didn't even need machine learning. These things were predictive. Um, they were interpretable. In other words, you could look at features that you could measure. And in, in, in the long run, it turns out these things could actually be intervened upon, right? So this is the standard that we're going for. We can treat blood pressure, we can treat cholesterol, we can minimize smoking, we can get people to exercise, and ultimately, not only can we predict risk, but we can also ameliorate some of that risk as well. So this is the framework that it'd, it'd be wonderful to get to in um, psychiatry in the long run. All right, so this is a heart. Um, it, it turns out um, cells in the heart can do a lot of the same things that cells in the brain can do. So they can transmit ions back and forth across the surface to generate action potentials. If you were sitting in the audience and you had chest pain, you get in the hospital, one of the first things they would do is stick leads on your chest and measure electric flow through your heart. Um, that would give you something that looks like this. this. is an EKG. You don't need to do machine learning on it because we've already figured out the patterns that have meaning by going through large amounts of the population and figuring out which patterns generalized. In other words, which patterns are interpretable and across subject tell us about the function of the heart. And there are even some disease cases in which there's a, a, aberrant electrical processing in the heart. This is Wolf Parkinson's white, in which there's a reentrant rhythm. And, and so we have a framework in which we can take cells that do many of the same things that brain cells do in, our, in terms of generating electrical potentials. We can diagnose it, we can predict it, and we can also ultimately figure out what the best possible treatment is. And one of the reasons they were able to get here is not only because of the advancement of the human technology, but because you have really good animal models as well. So I spent some time with my friend who's a cardiologist at UCLA, and he was showing me the pigs and the pig hearts and the measurements they were doing. It turns out this is really challenging to do when you talk about mental illness, and for some of the reasons that Bruce talked about earlier. <laughs> so the challenge is, the things we're interested in, which are emotional states, it's really hard to measure them in animals, right? Um, you can certainly ask an animal if it's happy or sad, the animal won't answer, and if it does, there are lots of psychiatrists around who are willing to talk to you. And, and, and so the challenge here is that it's difficult to stitch animal models into the disease that we're talking about, not only to understand normal function, but one of the things that's become increasingly clear to me over time, and I'm an animal researcher, is that animals literally don't get psychiatric illnesses because they are, by definition, human illnesses, right? So animals don't get schizophrenia, they don't get depression, they don't get bipolar disorder, because you can almost think of being a, a non-human animal as an exclusion criteria, right? And so this is a major challenge with how we think through these illnesses and how we even as researchers attack this. And, and one of the, um, the studies that I came across um, several years ago that, that helped reframe how we thought about this was a human neuroimaging study. And so this is an fMRI-based study, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And what they're doing there is they're looking at changes in blood flow in the brain. And the idea is that when cells become more active, they need more energy, they need more blood, right? And so it's looking looking at changes in the oxygen ratio, or how much energy cells are using in the whole brain. And what they did here was they took a bunch of, of students, they're Duke students, so they're not normal subjects, they're healthy though, and they put them in a scanner. And then they showed them a bunch of movies, and the movies were happy movies, sad movies, angry movies, as they're looking at activation across the whole brain. And so they're looking at these thousands, hundreds of thousands of basically bits of brain activity, and then they feed it into a computer and they use machine learning. And the idea there is can you predict or extract the patterns of activation in a brain that are linked to the emotional states? You send the kids home, bring them back in the next day, and then you tell them to sit in the scanner and do nothing which we're all terrible about at, right? And so the students eventually stop doing nothing. The researcher taps them after about 20 minutes and said, what were you just feeling? 
And then you take that self-report, and the question is, can you predict what they were feeling based on what their brain said they should have been feeling? And it turns out they can actually do this. And what this means is that you can then extract a self-report out of a human brain without the need for a human to tell you what they're actually feeling. And perhaps this is the type of strategy, if we can figure out how to employ to animals, if we can think about emotions as states that the brain generates, can we use that type of strategy to now link animals and humans together so that we can come up with this EKG like framework um, that we could apply to human neuropsychiatric disorders. So that's the type of strategy that we try to use in my lab. All right, so the, the, the technology that we use is we implant electrodes, each the size of a piece of hair, into a mouse's brain. Like um, a, an EKG, the more leads, the better, right? And so we target many brain areas simultaneously. We can simultaneously record the equivalent of brain waves, but from inside the brain, from the tips of wires, from 16 areas simultaneously, so we can get field potentials, which are telling you about how lots of cells are working together. We can also get the activity of individual cells in the brain. After the surgery, the mouse wakes up, and we can record its behavior as we're extracting brain information as well. And I'll walk you really quickly through the types of things we can do with this brain wave. You'll hear me use the term local field potential, or LFP, as well, local field potential. All right, so the local field potentials, these are brain waves basically recorded from the tips of the wire, so they're sampling activity right around the tip. Um, and we can record that from many brain areas simultaneously. Each of these brain waves, you can imagine that they're waves. We can filter them in different frequency and quantify the amount of activity in each frequency in each area, right? So we already have a lot of data, many areas, and information in the different frequencies in the different areas. Think of this as you have a frequency that's your QRS complex, and then you can also ask how many QRS complexes you have over time, right? So heart rate, and you can also look at um, the, the electricity flowing through your heart. The second thing we can do is we take advantage of some engineering principles, and so we, we know in, in the engineering space, things that change together over time tend to lie within a common system. So we can ask if these brain waves within frequency change together over time. This is two brain areas, hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. You can see that the peaks tend to synchronize across time. Um, we tend to refer this either as synchrony or coherence. We can also do some cool mathematical tricks with this. We can shift one relative to another and ask if the future coupling in one area couples to the current activity in another using statistical forecasting. And so then we can infer information flow out of which area, which direction the information flow is moving in. Think about this like things like Granger causality. Right? All right, and then, or we can shift it the other way and ask if coupling gets better in the other direction. So this is the type of data that we can pull out of an animal's brain. And this obviously creates a massive number of problems, right? First of all, we have many brain areas, right? We have many brain areas changing across frequency. We have the frequencies interacting with each other. And then we know within this complex brain, we have brain areas or brain circuits that are responsible for behavior and doing things. And then we have other brain circuits that are doing things because those brain circuits are doing things, right? So we have primary brain circuits, and then we have compensatory brain circuits. And all of this is going on simultaneously inside of this organ with about 80 billion neurons and a whole bunch of other cells that are actually doing really important important things. And so we started struggling with how to solve this problem, right? We're trying to solve this problem of how behavior and information is organized at a state level. And ultimately, we ended up working with some electrical engineers at Duke to tackle this problem. And I'll show you quickly the solution that we came up, and I'll show you how that stitches into the biology. So we came up with this three-tiered model, and, uh, and what, what, there were several things that were critical about this three-tiered model. First of all, a neuroscientist had to believe something that came out of the other end because we're neuroscientists, right? Um, secondly, we had to make this relevant not only for basic neuroscientists, but we wanted a level of the model that a human neuroscientist would think that was important, and I'll explain how we do that. And then we wanted another level of the model that related to external behavior, and we'll call that emotional states. So the bottom level is going to be what we call my level, right? It's the neuroscientist level. And so we're going to feed in these features. They're things that we're recording at the temporal precision of milliseconds. And these are the fast oscillations, the activity in each area, the activity in each frequency, the interaction between them, and the directionality, right? So out of all of this information we recorded, we've got about 8,000 predictors. And so we're going to feed that into the model, about 8,000 predictors. And that's going to be the bottom tier. 
The next tier is we're going to say, well, we know emotions are at least encoded at the seconds time scale, and we know that from the human neuroimaging data, right? And as yeah, I think through all the times I talk with my patients, no one ever complained about being sad for a millisecond. So we'll say at least the brain is generating states that are stable over the course of seconds. So what the second tier is going to do, it's going to say these millisecond level features is going, are they're going to change together, right? So they're fast oscillations that are going to turn on and off together. They're synchronous things that are going to happen on and off together, and that's going to be the second tier of the network in milliseconds. And then what we're going to say is the task label, in this case we'll say happiness, sadness, anger, frustration, is going to be a combination of networks that turn on and off together. So happiness might be like 50% network one and 20% network three. Sadness might be a little bit of network six and a sprinkle of network 17. And what we're going to do with machine learning is we're essentially going to try to learn the red lines, right? So what are the predictors that make up the networks? What are the networks that make up the task states? And, and, and I, won't, I don't have a lot of time to walk you through the task labels, but we're, what we're essentially trying to do in this case is predict future response to stress and the behavioral problems that emerge as a result of experiencing stress. And the reason we chose stress is I had this repeated observation in the clinic that whether it was bipolar disorder or depression or schizophrenia, stress was there at the onset, stress made it worse, stress brought you back in, right? So if we can think about targeting something like stress, we might hit a common biological pathway that's the same as targeting blood pressure. You end up treating heart disease and strokes, right? So it's a common thing that we can target that ultimately is cross-cutting for disease. All right, so we end up coming up with these networks that look like this, um, and we call them, they're based in electricity, um, and they're functional connectomes. So we call them electomes because we always wanted to come up with a cool name for something. And what the electomes are essentially telling you is what's going on in each brain area. Those You can see that around the rim of the tire. Um, what's going on in each frequency. So if you see color around the tire, that means that frequency in that area is important. And then the lines between them suggest that there's information in these two things being synchronized together. So you can almost think about this like a a symphony of an orchestra, right? There's information in the two instruments playing together. So it's not just one that the drums are going or that the violins are going. These things are timed together, and that's really important for the feeling that you have in the music. So we end up coming up with pictures that look like this, and ultimately we can learn these networks and show that these networks actually show up in the case of animals when they start having stress-induced behavioral dysfunction. And we also find in the, in the animal models that we use in this case, genetically identical mice, that you can actually find network differences in these mice before they're stressed that allow you to predict which mice will tolerate the stress well and which mice won't tolerate the stress well. And we can do this with an AUC of about 0.92. So we can do this really well in these genetically identical animals. All right, so we end up with something that looks like this, right? We have our disease model in this case, we'll just call it an animal model of major depressive disorder. Um, so we have our disease state. Um, we know that things like antidepressants make the brain function more normally. In this case, instead of aging, we're interested in severe stress or psychological stress. And what our data allows us to do is actually separate out the red from the green before they experience stress. And so now we have this new signature. It's not blood pressure or cholesterol or, um, or smoking. We'll just call it vulnerability. And we can ask these very precise questions. Is vulnerability something that our current treatments target, or is this a new biological pathway that we have no idea what to target, how to target it whatsoever, which is also very exciting as a scientist? So the, our strategy to this is we, we, we feel like we've done a really good job of becoming mouse psychiatrists, right? So we can predict risk in mice, which makes a fantastic paper, but doesn't help any of our patients. And so we wanted to think through how to at least get a sense of whether this signature that we found generalizes to other cases of stress tolerance, right? So if we can't get this to work in from mouse model to mouse model to mouse model, there's no real utility to thinking about how to get this to go from a mouse to a human. So we took advantage of four strategies to see if these signature, this predictive signature, generalized across contexts, and to be more complicated, we picked four levels of analysis. So this is the sort of thing Bruce was talking about. We picked, we did a molecular manipulation um, in a part of the brain called the hippocampus that we knew made animals vulnerable to future stress. And when we did that, our vulnerability signature showed up. So we can change one protein in one part of the brain, and this whole brain-wide network signature showed up. The next thing we did was we gave a new group of animals interferon alpha. This is a treatment used to treat hepatitis C. And one of the side effects of this treatment is it generates a syndrome that otherwise we would call depression, except it's an exclusion criteria, right? So phenomenologically, it looks just like depression. But because we know it's causing it, we don't call it depression. In any case, in this new group of animals, it treats, it causes the same brain signature to emerge in the animals, right? So that's our second external validation to show that it generalizes. The next thing 
thing we do is we take a new group of mice, and we know one of the risk factors for stress intolerance in humans is childhood trauma. So we put them through a paradigm that exposes them to stress very early in life, the first 20 days of life, and then we let them grow up normally. And when we look in these animals' brains, we find the signatures there again. So three things cause the same signature to show up. And then the fourth thing, we were interested in a genetic risk factor for depression and couldn't find a big one, a good one and ultimately decided that the biggest genetic risk factor for depression is having two X chromosomes, right? So 66% of people who get depression are women. So we just compare the difference between male mice and female mice, and indeed female mice start off with this signature in their brain, and it's almost universal. And so in these four cases, we essentially have this neurophysiological signature. It's a network level signature, so it's not just one brain area. It's how many brain areas are interacting together to essentially produce music in the brain. And that's the, 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 the issue that shows up in these animals heads. All right. So welcome to the future. Like, what does all this mean and where do we go from here? Right. What we're essentially trying to do now is create a self-report for mice, right, where we can extract electrical signatures out of an animal's heads and be able to tell what a mouse is thinking. And so we have, this is a combination of my graduate students and postdocs, and we're working on doing the same thing for anxiety and social reward, aggression, negative valence, and anticipation. And basically taking these psychological constructs and projecting them into a brain network state such that we can quantify them in real time as a mouse is performing. And, and one of the reasons this is really important is we can then test whether these signatures actually generalize across species. So we're going to try to move from signatures inside of the brain to signatures that you can record from the scalp and then ask if those same signatures show up in human beings as well. And so here's the idea. We can extract local field potentials in humans. It'll be EEGs. Because we've learned how to take these local field potentials and change them into the network state, right? It's the same way we basically take the cardiac electrical recordings and change it into an EKG so we can look at it. We can transform brain signatures to these network states. And we can actually do this in real time now. So we can do this with a delay of about 100 milliseconds. So we get a real time measure of what these network states are in an animal's head. And then the next set of experiments we're going to test is whether once we extract these network states, can we stimulate the brain in such a way to suppress one state and not suppress another? So you can imagine the idea of suppressing aggression when it shows up, but you don't want to turn it off all the time because there's other situations you might need it. Right? You don't want to turn off anxiety or fear all of the time or somebody walks into the middle of the street and gets hit by a car. You want to turn it off in the case in which um, there's disease. And so the idea is as these new technologies are being developed in humans, right? the subnet is already allowing us to do electrical recordings from inside of the brain in humans humans, and we're thinking about ways to do this with new um, nanotechnology as well. What we're going to try to do is learn how this information is organized, manipulated in real time, extracted and manipulated such that we can control these states in humans. And um, I'd like to finish here um, because I know the idea sounds a little bit out there, but it's just as out there as these techniques would have seemed 100 years ago in which we're augmenting heart function using electricity in real time and augmenting hearing um, in real time as well. So welcome to the future. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.